everyone. Welcome to the last week of our IEP series. Uh, today, Ko and I will be talking about the philosophy of generative linguistics versus LLMs. Um, so we really want this lecture to be uh, informal, where uh, myself, as a generative linguist, who only recently put on an engineer's hat, will be interviewing Ko, uh, who's a mathematician, a computer scientist, and an engineer. And I love how Anthony summarized our lecture as a pair of dogs, talking about a paradox. <laughs> so I think the paradox really has two parts. First, why do we know so much when we know so little? Um, so when it comes to language acquisition, the language data we are exposed to um, as a language learner are rather impoverished, and yet, we know everything about what is grammatically possible and impossible within the language we speak natively. This leads to uh, the universal grammar hypothesis, uh, namely, we are born with an innate ability to acquire language. Um, and second, uh, why do LLMs know so little when they know so much? So LLMs are trained on a huge amount of language data and have huge context window, and yet they still fail at certain linguistic tasks. And this leads to a learnability question, namely, can LLMs learn grammar? Oh, why is it? It's because I did this thing. So my part of it is that I think LLMs do know grammar. At least I think so. Um, I want to talk about why I think that they can learn it, why it makes sense that they would be able to um, through expressiveness and generalization. And uh, I just want, my, my point of view is that there's really no issue with this and no one should be mad about it if they even are. Um, so I'll hand it back over to Fulon. Um, so we will begin by talking about uh, the philosophy of generative linguistics, which is strongly advocated by Noam Chomsky, uh, who is known as the founder of Modern Linguistics, who's also a co-founder of uh, the MIT Linguistics Department. Um, so Chomsky's over, overall philosophy is just like how there is math behind the physical world, it's also possible to use a formal system to explain and predict empirical facts um, that we can reveal about language. Concretely, it is possible to describe a finite set of principles that are common to all languages and a finite set of parameters that determine the surface language variations. And to get into Chomsky's perspective, let's consider how uh, we, when we were infants, acquired language. Um, so when we were infants, we probably heard sentences like, I know who you met yesterday, uh, where the sentence contains uh, a WH word who and a gap after meet or met. Um, and sentences like, I know that you met Mary yesterday, where there isn't a WH word and there isn't a gap in the sentence. However, we are probably not explicitly taught that sentences like, I know who you met Mary yesterday, or I know that you met yesterday, are ungrammatical, are sentences we shouldn't say as English speakers. So these sentences, these ungrammatical sentences are not part of uh, the stimulus or the language data we are exposed to. Um, similarly, a sentence like who while John's kissing annoy you is an ungrammatical sentence which is likely not in the corpus or language data we are exposed to. Um, and the sentence is interesting in that it's ungrammatical with a WH word who at the beginning and a gap uh, that refers to the WH word who. Um, a grammatical version of the, the first sentence could be something like, who while John's kissing annoy, uh, which interestingly contains uh, one WH word followed by two gaps. Um, what is also not 
in part of uh, the language data we are exposed to are ungrammatical sentences like, I wonder who Zhang either kissed or is going to kiss you. Here again, the sentence has a WH word and a gap that refers back to the WH word, and yet the sentence is ungrammatical. And to make it grammatical, one way to do it is to make another gap in the other part of the either or phrase. So I wonder who Zhang either kissed or is going to kiss. Um, so the point I really want to make here is that the complement space of the stimulus, that is the language data we are not explicitly taught to be grammatical or ungrammatical, is infinitely large. We don't know what we don't know. And quite similarly, we also don't know what we know about the language we speak natively. Um, as a spoiler, we actually know everything about what is grammatically possible or impossible within the language we speak natively. So for example, we know that WH sentences, uh, which are sentences that contain a WH word somewhere, require uh, a fuller gap dependency. When there is a WH word, we need there to be a gap in the rest of the sentence that refers back to the WH word. And when there isn't a WH word, we don't want a gap. So when there is a mismatch between the WH word and a gap, those sentences are guaranteed to be ungrammatical. And that is something we know. What we also know is that, is that such fuller gap dependency is context sensitive. And linguists describe the relevant context here in terms of uh, syntactic islands. So let's first consider this baseline sentence, Zhang's kissing Mary will annoy you. This, uh, this sentence has um, a complex subject. Zhang's kissing Mary, this event will, will annoy you. And if we want to question the identity of Mary in the baseline sentence, we would try to say something like, who will Zhang's kissing annoy you? But the results of this sentence is ungrammatical. That is something that native speakers cannot say. And uh, what's happening here is what a linguist uh, describes as a subject island, namely, uh, the complex subject, John's kissing Mary, creates an island for the WH word to move out of. Um, and the second case, uh, let's again consider the baseline uh, sentence first. I know John either kissed Mary or is going to kiss you. In this case, if we try to question the identity of Mary, we might try to say something like, I wonder who John either kissed or is going to kiss you. Again, the result is ungrammatical. And in this case, the ungrammaticality comes from what linguists uh, call uh, coordinate structure constraint. Uh, here, we are trying to move the WH word from within only one part of uh, the conjunct uh, led by either or to the front, but not the other part of the conjunct. Uh, in the third case, again, let's consider the baseline sentence. John heard the rumor that Mary uh, John heard the rumor that Mary kissed Tom. And here, if we try to question the identity of Tom, we might try to construct a sentence like, "Who did John hear the rumor that Mary kissed?" And again, we cannot do that. The reason why we cannot do that is because here we um, would incur. Uh, a complex noun phrase island constraint or violation. Here, the complex phrase is the entire uh, object of here, the rumor that Mary kissed Tom. And again, in this case, we cannot create a gap by moving the WH word from this complex noun phrase uh, to the front. Uh, it's, it's just not linguistically possible. And we as native speakers know that we won't create a sentence like that. Um, so here's another example. I want to talk about the linguistic distribution of the F word. And I was encouraged to swear properly. 
Um, so here we go, another fucking example. So a standard way of swearing is to put the F word before another word, uh, like fucking Massachusetts, fucking Institute, fucking technology. This is not very interesting. What is interesting is that we could also insert the word fucking into a word. And we as native speakers know exactly where we can or cannot insert fucking into any word. So take the word Massachusetts. We know that we can insert fucking after uh, the second syllable. So Massa fucking Chusets, but probably not Ma fucking set Chusets or Massa true fucking sets. Now with the word institute, uh, I think there really isn't a way to insert the word fucking. I tried in fucking institute, sounds really bad. Insta fucking toot, that's really bad. Uh, now with the word technology, we could insert uh, fucking after the first syllable. So tech fucking knowledge, that's cool, but not techno fucking logy. Um, so some grid spacers love dinosaurs. Do we know what this is? <laughs> that's a good try. Um, so it's probably a micro fucking Pachycephalosaurus or a micro, uh, sorry, did I say mucking? No, sorry. Micro fucking Pachycephalosaurus and probably a micro patchy fucking Cephalosaurus. But I heard it's best to say it's a micro patchy cephal, micro patchy cephalofucking saurus. Um, so clearly native speakers of English know exactly where fucking can or cannot be inserted within a word. And more generally and broadly, we as native speakers of a language uh, know whether any sentence, any phrase, any word, any sound sequence is grammatical or not within the language we speak. We actually know a lot. It's just that we don't know what exactly we know about the language. Now the question is, why do we know? Um, this is where Chomsky comes in and propose um, the, the, the universal grammar hypothesis. Um, basically, we are born with an innate knowledge um, such that we can acquire language organically. So just to get the logic straight, the reasoning behind UG or the innateness hypothesis is that the language data we are exposed to are rather impoverished. And yet we just know everything about what is grammatical or ungrammatical within the language we speak natively. And this leads to the hypothesis that we are born with some knowledge such that we can acquire language. And this innate knowledge is what Chomsky refers to as uh, the universal grammar. So in 1957, uh, Chomsky imagined UG to be a finite set of rules that can be applied to generate exactly those grammatical sentences in a given language. And for example, by applying the rules one to eight, uh, we can generate the sentence, the man will hit the ball. Um, later, Chomsky developed a more uh, articulated model known as the Y model. And the basic idea is that sentences are, higher, are hierarchically built in the syntax by putting words in uh, a lexicon into phrases and by applying transformational rules where the ordering of phrases and words can change and we will be ready to pronounce a sentence and achieve uh, an understanding of its semantic meaning. And putting UG in a broader context, Chomsky suggests that there is a finite uh, set of principles that are common to all languages and a finite set of parameters that determine the surface variations among languages. And a linguist's goal is to figure out what the principles and parameters are about language. 
more recently, Chomsky suggested a more minimalistic approach to, U, to UG. Uh, basically, the Y model is still kept, but the operations involved in the syntax is much simplified to leverage on um, human brain as a computational system. Um, so now we are ready to compare ourselves with LLMs and ask what they know about language. So on the one hand, LLMs um, seems more powerful than a human brain. Um, a large language model is trained using massive data sets, hence large. And LLMs can maintain a large amount of data in its context window, which, which is analogous to human working memory, but is vast. However, I want to show that they still fail at certain linguistic tasks. Um, so to assess GPT's linguistic capacity, I tested two versions of GPT's judgment of ungrammatical sentences due to syntactic island violations. And basically, based on the results, I am not convinced that LLMs have knowledge of subject islands or complex MP islands. Let's just look at some concrete examples. So the general setup is I ask, uh, like, I, I give LLM a base sentence, like sentence one, John's kissing Mary will annoy you. And then I ask, can I question the identity of Mary in sentence one by asking uh, the sentence two, who will John's kissing annoy you? And uh, GPT 3.5 gave me a positive answer. Yes, you can query the identity of Mary in one by asking two, which is an ungrammatical sentence to native speakers. And then I follow up by asking, uh, is two a grammatical sentence? Um, and this is where things get a bit interesting. So GPT 3.5 responded yes, but then gave me a description of a sentence that actually is a grammatical sentence. So who is the person that John's kissing will annoy? Um, so at first I thought, oh, GPT 3.5 failed at subject at applying subject island constraints, but then it seems like it misunderstood two by somehow corrected it. So now we turn to GPT-4 and we use the same setup. Uh, sentence one is just a baseline sentence and I ask whether I can query the identity of Mary by asking an ungrammatical sentence due to subject island uh, violation, who will John's kissing annoy you? And GPT-4 um, gave me a negative response, which is great. However, it voluntarily offered me an ungrammatical sentence. Who is the Mary that is not the ungrammatical part? Who is the person that John's kissing will annoy you? Here, who is the WH word and the gap is within a complex subject. So the, the sentence is still ungrammatical and it's offered to me by GPT-4. Um, I will skip the nice part of LLM performance and go straight to the awful parts. So when it comes, com when it comes to complex NP island, uh, again, I use the same setup. I give them a baseline sentence five. John heard the rumor that Mary kissed Tom and I ask, can I query the identity of Tom uh, in five by asking six, which is an ungrammatical sentence, who will Zhang, who did Zhang hear the rumor that Mary kissed? And here, um, GPT 3.5 gave me a positive answer. Yes, you can question the identity of Tom in five by asking an ungrammatical sentence. And I follow, followed up by asking a six, a grammatical sentence. Um, and GPT-4 failed to rule out six as an ungrammatical sentence, basically. The same thing happened to GPT-4 against the same setup. And when I ask whether I can ask an ungrammatical sentence, um, GPT-4 responded positively. So 
So we talked about two parts of a paradox. First, why do we know so much when we know so little? And secondly, why do LLMs know so little when they know so much? Both parts of the paradox lead to a general learnability question of how any agent, a human, an animal, or a machine could in principle achieve such a thing as acquiring a language. So we acquire language organically. And according to Chomsky, this is because we are born with UG or an innate ability to acquire language. And LLM seems more powerful than the human brain. So I guess a natural question to ask at this point is, um, can LLMs acquire human-like linguistic capacity? And if we assume that Chomsky is right about UG, we can further ask, is UG machine learnable? And this is when I invite Cole to give me an answer. Thank you, Pilon. Um, so yeah, I think they do. I think they they already. I think they already kind of do. Um, yeah, I, I include this here because uh, this is my like amount of qualifications on the subject. It's like the same as that guy who predicted that CERN would make a black hole when he had a physics minor. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so anyway, reiterating my plan. Um, so I think that they're pretty great at grammar. Fulon showed us them failing, uh, which is fair. Um, that did happen. Um, but I think sometimes with prompting approaches, you might be seeing a failure to follow instructions instead of an actual failure to understand the underlying thing. Um, so like a lot of why I think they're good just comes from my own experience, having submitted millions of prompts, thousands actually, not millions, but um, here's just some the random first thing that came to my mind. You told me that a blue streak of cherries hit you, but why? And we asked this to Santa Monica and it completes, why did it happen? A blue streak of cherries hitting you could be a metaphor or a symbolic representation of something. Like, I feel like it's probably never seen anything like that, but it's doing a pretty good job of like conjugating it and returning it back to me. Um, so how do we kind of figure out if they know this stuff, even though they might not actually, uh, really be trained well enough to follow instructions to tell us what's in their little minds. Um, so this is a paper that Fulon sent to me. Um, but I think Fulon didn't like it, but I liked it. Um, basically you use the, uh, log probabilities of the next token to measure how surprised the LLM is to see something. So in uh, one of the bad examples that Fulon showed us, I know who you met Mary yesterday, the LLM when it gets to the token Mary is like, WTF did I just read? It's surprised to see that. So these are some like uh, basically like gaps in how probable it thinks Mary or a gap would be uh, in that spot. And basically GPT-3 sort of did uh, exhibit that it was very surprised to see a non-gap there. Um, here's another example of, of them learning some cool stuff. This is actually way back in the BERT days. Um, so we have this super complicated sentence um, <clears throat> with some kind of like parse tree, like a context-free grammar type of parse tree. And uh, actually, these authors were able to train embeddings that just used, you know, the, the bird embeddings, the, the hidden layer. Um, we're able to embed them in in uh, a space in such a way that the minimal spanning tree in that space was actually equal to the parse trees that uh, these like pen tree bank style parses were giving you. Um, and this general idea, I think, is pretty cool of probing, which is like, see if your model latently knows something by training a much weaker model from the hidden state to predict some interesting structure. Um, and so basically, this is some evidence that uh, that this knowledge of grammar is actually inside the LLM somehow. 
Um, questions? So how can they learn this? Like, I'm let's let's come along with me for the ride and say that they are good, um, even if you don't really think that. So how could they? And I think it's because they can basically learn anything. Um, why is that? Um, first of all, they are very expressive. Um, this is Chomsky's hierarchy of languages. So regular is basically stuff that you can recognize with the regex, all the way up to recursively enumerable, which is anything you can recognize with the Turing machine. And I am hoping that people agree that at least uh, there is an algorithm to recognize grammar. Golan, do you think this algorithm at least exists? Depends on the definition of the algorithm. Like, could a Turing machine do it? It's a hard question. I'm inclined to say. No? OK. Well, I feel like you should be able to, because we humans are like, we're still machines, right, in my opinion. We're like some kind of mushy machines that are doing doing computations. And we, we're really good at it. That is innate to us. Like, well, yeah, but I feel like it still has to be physical hardware doing it in some sense. Um, so, so I want to assume that at least a Turing machine can decide grammar. And in that case, uh, transformers should, in principle, with chain of thought, be able to decide grammar. Because basically, it was this neat result that um, if you allow transformers to have some intermediate tokens, then they can actually uh, simulate a Turing machine's output, um, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, it's not super realistic because these folks are like hand picking the parameters of all their transformers to implement a Turing machine. Um, so like, fine, they could learn it, but are they learning it? Um, like, what if they're just memorizing? Um, this is like a famous bad study where, where, where some um, people found that if you took state-of-the-art vision models and just put random labels on the images, uh, then the model would still learn that, um, which is like weird that like something can both be doing well, but yet have the capacity to memorize random noise. So what if this is happening? Um, and that's the dream of scale, is that this is not happening. Um, there's this scaling law from the Chinchilla paper where uh, folks found that if you train an LLM on like a huge, huge corpus, this is actually the loss uh, that you obtain on a held out data set. So that's something that the LLM didn't see. Um, and basically, this shows that there is some form of, empirically at least, we see some form of generalization. Um, so like, stepping back, I sort of don't want to argue about like, oh, does it understand like island constraints or does it understand context for grammar, context sensitive stuff? I just want to say like, you know, it can pretty much learn whatever it seems like. So let's just argue about whether it, whether this, this law is actually true and whether we can prove this law, what it says. Um, there was a recent paper sort of that posed a model for actually like uh, training data, suggesting that if you learn training data well enough for that scaling law to hold, you actually have to achieve some of the underlying skills that were used to make up that training data. Um, which I think is a pretty cool paper, um, still a bit vague in my opinion, but um, it's still pretty cool. This, the paper I just, on the previous slide, basically shifts the burden from explaining like mechanistically, how are they inferring like island constraints or whatever, to um, let's figure out how they achieve these scaling laws, um, how they generalize on uh, these data sets. Um, and like, why does stochastic gradient descent 
plus over parameterization and regularization work so well. Um, in my opinion, it's sort of not going to be about mechanistic interpretability, but like showing that an overparameterized model, when you train it with gradient descent, is going to prefer a simpler uh, solution rather than memorizing all the data. Um, but that's just my my dream. Um, and I, I don't know, I think it's going to be pretty hard to mechanistically interpret what they're doing, these LLMs. There's been some some attempts to do that, but I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty hard. Um, and I guess the question is like, does this refute anything or cause any problems for UG? And in my opinion, I don't, I don't think so. It just seems to me like huge model, very expressive, is learning a function that I think is probably decidable. So I don't see why it's so surprising, or if it even is surprising. Um, and like the UG thing is still fine in my mind because humans, they're learning all this stuff with way better, uh, less data. So they basically just have a better architecture. Like maybe they, uh, like you can imagine if you took GPT-4 and froze like 90% of its parameters and randomly initialized the other 10%, it would probably learn a lot faster. And like maybe that 90% is what's baked into humans already. Um, I don't know. All right, so Mulan can come back up and start our debate phase. So now we are at our war and peace phase. We will start by being mean to each other and um, address- and Also opening the audience up to be mean to all of us right. as well. So we are desperate for any mean questions from the audiences first, before we start being mean to each other. I'll bite. Um, this is a question. Um, so I am not trained as a linguist, mm -hmm. but I mean, if I think about like in physics, uh, there's, if you study like quantum mechanics, there's this idea that quantum mechanics is really weird theory. And obviously there must be some, um, more elegant, more understandable theory, and we just are not modeling some hidden variables, like hidden variables. Um, the idea is that maybe there's some magic thing that makes something different, like some X factor. And so I wonder, to me, um, I think treating a language model as a linguistic system only um i'm curious like what is the most easily reproducible uh test that you could probe a person with linguistically where they would succeed and an llm would fail because for me it's getting really hard to concoct mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong there's plenty of things that people do better mm -hmm. But I just mean a fundamental, like, if there is some other missing X factor, this little like sprinkle of magic in the in the mind that, that makes it better at language, there should be a test that distilled it down to something where it hard fails for the LLM and hard succeeds for the person. And I think you're you're orbiting maybe some, but I am I'm actually just very curious if you can help guide us to something that's like a bit of a smoking gun for the hidden variable for the little sprinkle of magic. This is not a mean question. And so I don't want to be mean in my response either. I mean, I can, I can be mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think you can summarize the question for us? Yes. Um, so Anthony's question in a not so mean paraphrase is that, um, is there, more or less a systematic way that linguists would have in mind about uh, assess, uh, I guess, assessing um, human language capacity versus LLM language capacity. Is that your question? Not even as, not so much systematic as like an elegant small probe that, that, it, that shows there's a, 
there is at least one angle that you can attack a language model as a language system. And it just can't succeed at all. I don't think the question rests so much on the probe. Um, because we want to be fair to LLM. We want to make sure that it's not the instruction or the probing part of um, the task that makes LLMs fail, but rather it's it's generally the case that they, they, they lack certain knowledge that humans just innately have or implicitly know about language. Um, so just to be fair, Ko and I struggled a bit to figure out how to make GPT fail. Um, some professors at MIT Linguistics loved posting uh, Facebook posts, uh, screenshots of like LLM failures. We tried to replicate some of those with GPT-4, but um, GPT-4 performed really well. But still, I feel like, um, like, well, here's just how I guess I would try to approach um, this task of making LLMs fail. Um, I think fundamentally, um, like the complement space of language data is infinite. And this infinite space consists of ungrammatical sentences um, that are ungrammatical for for whatever reasons, and grammatical sentences that are just way too complex for us to casually produce um, in the corpus that LLMs can collect in their training data. And because the complement space of the stimulus is, is vast, there ought to be places where we can question whether LLMs can categorize a sentence as ungrammatical or grammatical, but it's just not in its training set, but it's capable of understanding that it's it linguistically just involve a grammatical derivation with some iteration process of applying rules and whatever transformations uh, to build. Um, and this is sort of how we found island constraints, because it's essentially a type of context-sensitive grammar. Uh, there is a gap. On the face of it, the ungrammatical sentences contain a WH word and a gap. But whether at the end of the day the sentence is grammatical depends on the linguistic context of the gap. If the gap is embedded in certain weird positions, then the sentence is ungrammatical. Um, and I still think GPT failed. I'm not sure if this answered your question, but namely, I feel like just logically, if UG is right, namely there are things that humans must innate in order for them to acquire language organically, then these rules, these principles will have to be in some sense not machine learnable. And that's why fundamentally I'm not so sure whether languages can be modeled as Turing machines. Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, I'm, I, I don't think my question is necessarily even intended to be very deep, but it's more like, again, returning to like physics, right? Like we had a model, there was a time in the late 1800s when we thought physics was solved. It was the late 1800s. Uh, Maxwell's equations had been worked out in full. The last of the mechanics had been kind of tested for over a century. And there was a very large growing consensus that physics was kind of done. And then, um, you know, we discovered the nucleus and started trying to model the atom. And uh, it became very clear that if we applied just like classical uh, electromagnetism and mechanics to an atom that the electron should just spin into the nucleus, right? And that was like a thread. It's like we tried to, we had a model right. of reality, right. that, and then we compared it to reality, mm -hmm. and then it didn't seem quite right. And so then we tugged on that thread, and we were able to design more and more precise tests 
um, in terms of the behavior of, of single particles, um, eventually leading to, I would say, like very elegant exemplars of the failing of plasma physics, like the, mm -hmm. like the double slit experiment, where it's just, you can do this very simple setup, right. where it's just smoking gun, it's just like, this is not going to work anymore. This is not a model of reality. And so, again, backing up, I really just mean, it, it, I think it's hard partly because we're doing a lot of these like one, two utterance probes, right? And by contrast, I think I love that, that paper, by the way, that you showed, the MIT one of Cole, where they, you know, showed with chain of thought how much you could replicate different, you know, generative language systems. I think something like that, but I'm inverted a little bit. So that's showing, look at all the stuff from formal language theory you can build mm -hmm. with an L. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't get all the way there because it doesn't, there's no one has ever proven that, including Chomsky, that like uh, generative grammars are equivalent to human language acquisition mechanisms. Also. I'm just saying like, what's something you can do that to you, even if it requires talking to the system for a very long time, or it's a statistical thing, like what's the best thing that you can think of that to you says, look, there's something about how humans generate or interpret language that this thing doesn't really seem right to me. You know? um, so I guess the question is, well, concretely, um, are steps we take uh, to probe an LLM to see whether they have acquired um, language capacity? Um, right. And I feel like this is what we do as linguists to come up with a theory um, in the first step. This is how we do research. So we see a bunch of language, well, uh, this is how we do research from a bottom-up perspective. We see a bunch of data that seems interesting, and we try to make empirical generalization based on the data. And as long as there's a level of abstraction involved in there, as long as we make some generalization based on a limited set of data, then from the generalization, we can further ask whether the generalization also predicts this set of data, which is not in the first set of data, that is grammatical or ungrammatical or whatever. So as long as there's a level of abstraction, um, there is prediction, and then we can test the prediction by then asking another set of data whether the data, the, the empirical facts, usually grammaticality, confirms or disconfirms our generalization. So now we have two data sets, we have a generalization that is that converges or not, and this process just keep on iterating. And this is how linguists come up with um, a proposal, a principle, a, a, a theory that has large empirical cap, uh, coverage. But this process is like iterative in nature. Um, and essentially, I think we can just do the same to test LLMs. Take a linguistic paper. If a paper is good, usually it doesn't present all the data at once and be like, here's a thousand different data we consider and here's one generalization we arrive at, we are right. Usually a linguistic paper will have a bunch of uh, argumentations like, based on this, we want to propose this, now we test this to see whether the proposal is right and we have this data to argue for or against an alternative. We can take that paper and just try to present LLMs uh, each set of the data and just see how they perform. And I think that's just the general formula that would be, that, that is like, it, it would be interesting to, to actually try that. I didn't think of trying that, but it would be cool. I'm well, sorry if I was either too mean or not mean enough, but I apologize either way if I'm not here. <laughs> if I wasn't there. Um, but is the second answer close to what no, is the, is the second response close to what your question was about? Um, it was, but I'm not yet satisfied. But I don't know if anyone could 
I don't know, Cole, what do you think? I mean, I think that like, well, for one thing, it's hard because it's not, a, it's not just about, it's very hard to test LLMs in general because we only have access to particular LLMs. Right. So it's not like, we don't know whether it means that it will never be able to learn this. Um, but like, as long as you incorporate some amount of um, like prompt engineering or something into your test, mm -hmm. um, it should be fine to just sort of present this data to both humans and an LLM, like at a like a fairly large amount of data. It'd be like how much like it's going to be a matter of not of like yeah. complete utter failure for LLMs at this point in my mind, but. Like as long as you have some amount of uh, like probe to be fair to the LLM, like maybe you have like a linear probe to see whether the hidden state is correctly classifying this thing or not, or mm -hmm. um, you include like make sure that you follow prompting best practices, like a few shot examples or something like that. Um, I think that would be a lot more convincing if like basically like even after like a good like five shot prompt or something like that, you have a bunch of sentences that an LLM can't correctly identify mm -hmm. as grammatical, but right. humans can. Right. Um, I don't. I guess that doesn't really answer your question about like you're saying you want some particular thing that we think that they can't do, or just a test. Well, yeah. So let me. The reason I asked this question was so the first three weeks we picked things that a person can obviously do that a language model by itself obviously can't do. I think language itself is probably a lot more complex than even like vision. Um, and because you, know, you can build whole universes out of language, right? Like you can be extremely specific defining how to build something and you're like ranging from like the instructions in Leviticus for how to build the Ark of the Covenant up through defining old fantasy worlds and novels. Like you can build universes and describe things in intricate detail of language, and you can even describe language with language, and which makes it much harder to probe than perception or planning, where I can just come up with a thing that I can do that a language model would break down. Because it's not built to do that, right? It's not a linguistic problem. Um, but now you're looking at I mean, a language model is designed to map, you know, to model, uh, you know, this predictive task that while many have argued for a long time is, according to the distributional hypothesis, the task to model language, right? That, like, you know, that language itself is just defined by what words are proximate to other words in what order. And I think that for me, uh, I can definitely get a language model to be worse than an artist at writing a poem or worse than an essayist at writing an essay. Like, that's, that, like, but I think you kind of got it, which is like, we can, I mean, we're talking about one LLM at its ability, its ability to do a language task slightly inferior to the best person, right? Which is not, that's not a smoking gun to me. And like you were saying, like, you know, also Cole, like, we, um, yeah, like it's very inefficient to pick consuming data, but for all we know, we've successfully embedded the human language system in a very inefficient way. But that doesn't mean we haven't embedded that machine, just that we did it inefficiently. And so to me, uh, this question I've been grappling with for about a year, which is, um, is there a little bit of magic about human language that we're like this little X factor that we just don't have at all. And uh, like this little hidden variable um, or, or are we there when it just comes to pure language? Um, and it's much harder than the other things. The other thing that tasks that a language model is not built to do. Um, but in terms of like models of language, I mean, all of the Chomsky models of language, I feel, are, I mean, they're all isomorphic to, I think, at best, just, you know, generative grammars. And that's a very probable, falsifiable thing that several folks have shown you can embed in a language model. And so for me, it's like, well, that's one of the most rigorous things 
do based on like you know 50 years of linguistic writing um and then there's also you know just like tricks like oh getting like a language model which is primarily doing a syntactic slash semantic task to do things like rhyme which is a phonetic task but even those things are getting increasingly well modeled by language models which, you know you have enough examples of, of you know, things that are sensitive to like phonetic spelling you're going to start getting better at that too and so it's actually getting hard for me to come up with probes which is why i'm probing you because i kind of thought by proxy you could then probe the machine i have like two responses first it's just purely conceptual um so i guess like if the task is just to compare humans with LLMs and show that somehow LLMs are inferior to humans. Like conceptually, the answer is of, of course you can show that because humans are perfect in that they or we are the knowledge. Like we know everything. That's the premise, that's the assumption. Like we are native speakers, we define what is grammatical in language and not. So conceptually, to show that LLMs are inferior to humans, we just need to show that they're not us. Like in, in whatever way, they're not us in terms of defining what is grammatical in the language and not. They are inferior to us. Like you never, okay, I'm not gonna go I feel on. like even if they, if they were better, we would be like, oh, that's different and wrong. Bad. Um, my other responses, like I want to change the setup a little bit. You're being mean. We don't get a chance to be mean to you. I wanted to be mean to Cole to begin with, but now that you made yourself a target. Yes. Yes. Sure. Sir, you touched on that. Could you go on elaborating on what actually means for it to be that there's not an algorithm that does algorithm? Um, so I guess what I mean by this is, um, so I think linguists actually try to, how do I do that? So in 81, Chomsky described, I guess, the Y model with, I guess, a mindset of UG still being a whole bunch of rules, a whole bunch of principles and parameters that uh, if we have them hardwired into the brain and set them right, then end up giving us the the capacity of generating only the grammatical sentences in the language we speak. But, oh, that was this. Um, but more recently, I think he's, he, 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 he himself wanted to um, try to get rid of principles and parameters that are part of the algorithm, but not mathematically expressible, like, there's this thing called an island. It describes the situation, but it's not something that can be mathematically expressed. It's just a um, description of the context. Uh, but he himself and us, since 95, tries to leverage on um, the fact that human brain is somewhat a computational system. Um, and the minimalist program is essentially an attempt to use basic operations like merge, where we put things together to put two things together as one piece and move where we take this thing we merged or like one of the things like a subset and move it to another, uh, another I guess, structural position and try to really describe language as a mathematical process. But even with minimalist program, I think there are still weird constraints that we have to 
propose uh, like economy constraints um, in order to restrict what is mathematically computable or not. Like uh, we can merge things together, we can move things from one place to another, but the movement has to happen without violations of certain economy constraints. And it's these constraints that make language not anything possible, but a restrictive set of things we do. And I'm not sure whether the constraints per se can be algorithmically built, if that makes sense. But I am not an expert on that. Okay. We, we, we decide. Okay, so, <laughs> so I guess right, there's like a clarification question mm -hmm. because I'm not too familiar since you guys use like stuff of context free grammar and universal grammar in both the CS sense and the linguistic sense. So I guess is there like an equivalent for universal grammar, I guess, in the CS sense? I mean, maybe this touches on one of my frustrations with what is universal grammar because I didn't find it to be precise enough to be saying anything. Like, I wasn't able to figure out uh, how to translate it into computer science, um, which was like something that sort of I had a hard time with. What are you saying? That? I was just going to say that what Kulong said about how the constraints on where you move the pieces that you form, if those aren't flushed out or like you know have i'm kind of confused on like how we can even have rules for those things that aren't just feelings right where it's like why how is that not completely flushed out algorithmically you know what i do you know what i'm saying yeah. um which is kind of what you're saying too right like if there's not or if i'm understanding correctly like if there's not rules that you can kind of flush out in a computer science sense or whatever, then how is the grammar well defined in the first place? So I guess like it's a genuine question. I wouldn't use the word problem, but <laughs> I think there is a gap between language universal and universal grammar. So universal grammar is a hypothesis that we the reason why we can we are perfect is because there's something innate to us. But language universal is something rather empirical. Um, there are, like, if we just look at language, like, like languages, and just think of the, the, like language as a concept, there are certain things about language that defines what a language is. There are things that are shared among languages. There are things that kind of like a switch that determines how two languages or two classes of languages uh, systematically differ. It's not that everything can be a natural language. There are pseudo languages that are not languages. Um, so empirically, there is language universals. There is systematic language variations. And a bottom-up researcher tries to use the data uh, to construct a theory which is empirically testable, falsifiable, but that doesn't directly answer anything about whether universal grammar is correct or not. We are working towards understanding what are the best ways to describe language universals and language variations. That's an empirical task that is um, something that we can argued to be right or not but independently what is universal grammar is something that is i don't know the word to me as well to this question yes so i guess you know how like we test us because like natalie's question was like there are stuff that we can't describe in like our english language right, that we can't explicitly say like say but mm -hmm. i guess in the cs sense the equivalent of that would be testing if the language is turned completely, right? Like if Python can write, you can write a Python interpreter in Python, 
And do you think that like English is terrible in the sense that can we write like a set of rules in English to interpret the English language? Like I know that surely that's like has been looked into, but I don't know. Is that the full universal grammar, I guess? Yeah, in yeah, some it's sense. In English specifically. Is that was can you write an English interpreter in English? like a, a bunch of transformational rules to represent what is grammatically possible or impossible in English. That was his starting point. Um, so, yes. Yeah, I mean, I guess my question is like, if that's like, A, like, do you think that that program is possible? Like, can you finish what, can linguists finish what Chomsky started and actually write, uh, yeah, an English interpreter, as Jeremy puts it. And it, like, if that's true, then like, why can't you do it for other languages? And if you just combine them all, doesn't that count as a universal grammar? Right. So I guess if you can do that for English, then it's it should be doable for other languages. It's like, if we've done it for one language, then it's just a matter of figuring out what things are shared among other languages, namely things we don't tweak, and things that can vary uh, from language to language, and hence we tweak. Um, I feel like the first, like, I'm just being honest here. I don't think writing an English interpreter as a linguist sort of go from from my limited experience as a linguist like because this goes back to my response to the student question natalie's question like there are certain things that i think can be written as rules but are these rules like interpretable to a machine it to some degree depends on how linguists model, um, model, I guess, the language faculty. We have to build a system or like a model that is machine expressible for us to then um, implement the rules. Like when we move something somewhere and want to restrict that movement, somehow we need the context in order to say where exactly we move from, where exactly we move to, why exactly we cannot move from here to here. And if the model itself lets us express every element in the rule using some computationally transparent language, then probably. In this case, it'll be like the machine of humans, right? And then this language of English. I guess we're not writing code, right? When I say English interpreter, I mean like you like write a book like that <laughs> interprets the English language and a person reads it and you like go through the book and you'll know how to understand any language or all the books. That's an ongoing process. And <laughs> honestly, I don't know how many principles and parameters that like there are intricacies of language that linguists discover on a daily basis. <laughs> So the the parameters, the number of parameters do not depend on how many languages there are. It's not a bit representation of like of a language. It depends on how complex we discover language to be. Um, and before that, else is this done, which I think it's just not gonna be done before I die. Um, I feel like we wouldn't be able to have an English interpreter. Phoebe. Is there a sense to you that we as humans are trying to build like this mathematical, essentially, mathematical model of language that so we're kind of trying to translate our own language into a machine? Kind of build up. And then we're trying to teach um, a model which is inherently mathematical. Mm -hmm. Our language by training it on our vocab right and 
So if we cannot translate something mathematically for it to understand that it cannot learn grammatical, like the whole grammatical structure from our language, that may be that disconnect some kind of group against universal. Um, so I guess I don't know why I try to give the same answer to every question, but like you all asking the same question. <laughs> um, like essentially, I feel like that's again about like how certain constraints or principles are not mathematically expressible probably or maybe it is it's just me not knowing how um so i'm just gonna be very concrete uh like we think we linguists think we some practitioners think uh a sentence is hierarchically built by uh, putting things in a in a in a syntactic tree in a hierarchical way, and in order to restrict things, like in order to derive syntactic islets, because we don't want something innate to our brain to be subject islet or coordination structure constraint. We want something concrete to be to be built to our brain. Uh, and the ion constraints are not the first principles. It's not like without anything, we just know there's an island. Um, so what we try to do is to derive syntactic islands via operations that we allow or don't allow us or whatever do. Like we can merge things together we can move things from one position to another, but there are certain cases where we just cannot move things, either because um, we have to move things to some intermediate uh, landing sites, but this landing site is not provided, or because something else is already occupying the landing site, or because uh, if we move something in here, this creates some certain structure that creates us problems in the future. Like the, this kind of language or uh, operations um, are how linguists try to solve certain puzzles, like why there are islands, why these islands, why subject islands, but not object islands, things like that. Um, and my lack of knowledge is whether that structural system, that movement-based theory, um, that like there's a lighting site here um, when it's occupied or when something happens here, you cannot move things. And that at the end of the day results in an ungrammatical sense uh, due to ion constraints, like all like whether that theory itself is mathematically expressible or not. Uh, do you think it's a space big issue? Like, do you think it's because of how many different sentences we possibly construct? Or do you think it's like what you said, it's not mathematics? Like, I guess Natalie's question in some sense is like, why languages are restricted? Why, yeah. why, why? Like, because we like in the island examples, all the baseline sentences are just fine. And what we are trying to do is just to ask the identity of certain thing in the baseline sentence and try to just use uh, a sentence with a WH word and a gap um, to express those sentences. But just, uh, like just for whatever reason, we cannot do that. It's not something that is conceptually, um, like why, why not? But yeah, but no. Could we it, don't do that. Could it just be like that it's it's mathematically expressible, but just nobody has the patience to write down all those rules? Like, it's just not pretty? Like, could that be? 
the end result, do you think? Um, honestly, my own answer is I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> my goal is not to build an English interpreter. Um, I am satisfied when I have discovered certain language universals. Um, I research on Mandarin and I feel satisfied when I feel like when, when I systematically argue for certain properties of Mandarin being the same as certain properties we kept finding in different languages. But I didn't care to then talk about these language universals and try to mathematically translate them. Is there a, this is like a, this is like a clarification question. Is there a defin, uh, definition, so like, yeah, definition of a valid language in linguistics? Like if I just, like, is there a set of rules that a language must follow for it to be valid? Um, there are like, you can construct, I guess, um, an unnatural language. Yeah, so there are certain, like, I think that's a good question. So there are principles and parameters and um, just think mathematically, the principles, uh, well, the principles are just things that are common among languages and, and the parameters are things that can be set this way or another in different languages. And in principle, a principle can be a parameter. Um, why are why are certain things that are shared among languages why don't languages differ on those shared properties uh, if the shared properties are made principles then we can just switch the principles to the other to like if it's if all languages are yes to a certain thing we can just try to make that no for all of them to construct a an unnatural language, but that is not not empirically what we find. There are principles. There are things that are shared among languages. Like. So we kind of we kind of tailored the definition of natural language to the languages that exist. Like a definition came after like all the languages we have. So yeah. I guess so. My question is like, so let's say you have like an LLM, right? Like mm -hmm. and I guess. My perspective is that what if they just spoke their own language, for example, like because in the end they're all just tokens and numbers, right? right? And like, so yeah. Like, well, it's not good, but, <laughs> yeah, in the end they're all tokens. So like, let's like, what if they have like an untrained language model? Mm -hmm. Is that a valid language, right? Just because we trained it on English doesn't make it any different. It's just tokens, it's like some sequence of tokens. So like. For example, untrained LLM, is that a natural language, you know? Like what makes the training process, like make it natural, you know? Like what's the, like are these rules? I don't know what these rules are, if you have examples of these rules, but like. Like, like every language it? has a subject. Like every, uh, every sentence has a subject, I guess, which is true of every language. Um, I can think of. Like even even when I say shut up, <laughs> there is an implicit subject. You are <laughs> Jeremy is the subject. Why am I the target? <laughs> Can I target everyone in the in the room with a question? Because because um I don't want to just scroll again. Uh, Your question, Bill. So when I was a little kid, I always thought it would be cool to kidnap a bunch of newborn babies and put them in like a, a world simulator with like no outside influence. Like somehow magically they would be able to survive until they could fend for themselves. Um, and they had no interaction and just developed a society on their or societies on their own. And one of the things that they would obviously have to develop is language, right? So how would these you know, blank-minded babies that don't even have a concept of language 
I did this with a bunch of babies. Yeah, now he's so you get you get the idea. Like so, in a world without language, how does how does it develop? Because at one point that was us. Not the babies, but like humanity didn't at one point was incapable of speech, and then they started speaking. Like the lame answer is UG. We are born with something, and what we need to do is just to set the parameters、uh, so that what we end up speaking is one existing language. Now there isn't an existing language to begin with. We just have a bunch of babies. But they have the UG. Maybe they just agree to set their parameters in a certain way, and they end up creating some language. That's a lame answer. What is? They come to a consensus. Yeah, Alice、yeah, Baby's、yeah. like, no, this is called black. Can I ask one more question? Yes. So you,、uh, this is. When do I get to target you all? Wait, what? When do I get to target you? Do I get a chance to ask my main question? Yes. Yeah.、Um, you to, you're in control. Well, you can ask your question. Your guest. <laughs> um, Jeremy was asking, are there laws or principles that dictate whether something is language, right? And you said yes. And my question is, like, if I if I draw a box around the earth, and I said, what are the laws in that box? There are law laws, like, for instance, conservation of energy, and then there are biological laws, like Bergman's rule that animals get bigger in colder climates or island dwarfism. There are general trends that have very few counterexamples, and then there's laws like you can't jaywalk, which are cultural. Is language a cultural law? Is it a biological emergent law, or is it something that you can literally write down a mathy foundation for and a falsifiable test, and it never violates? I might not have a direct response to your question, but like.、Um, One thing that I really appreciate Chomsky for is how、um, he made language itself the object of interest or the subject of interest、uh, by just asking about the essence of language as an object, as opposed to how. Language is、uh, a side product of、uh, the human society, and is culturally or his、uh, uh, it, it, it is dependent on history, culture, and the subject of say anthropology. So he wanted、um, us to focus on what defines a language. Independent of how each individual language is, how arbitrary ways, um, uh, like UG might manifest itself in a particular language, could be culturally dependent, and how language is a product of, like I guess, communication. Um, and other things that are more abstract.、Um, and now back to your question. So, where do we recognize UG in the context of all the laws we discover about, like the physical world and other things?、Um, I would think that Chomsky would probably say that UG is biological in the sense that we sort of acquire language not by 
um, proactively trying to learn the rules, but we grow up speaking the language, like how an organ is sort of just developed as we age. Um, and the language faculty is sort of a term that Chomsky uses to intentionally um, extract language capacity from general cognition. Um, and I think the intention here was to um, to, 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 to make it sound like an, an, an organ in, in some sense. So, like. So I know that Kevin had a meeting. I want to. So I think. And I don't get to target anyone. That's so mean. And we don't, <laughs> and we don't get to like There's the peaceful <laughs> message. <laughs> okay, now like I don't know. Are 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 we still recording or not? Yeah, yeah we know it's our stop recording. Who long wants to go off the record? I don't want what I say now to be recorded. <laughs> oh well, I don't want the sentence to be in the recording, so just please hit end recording. But now I'm extremely excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cannot wait to hear what you're talking about. <laughs> Hello, thank you for calling Grid Spaces YouTube channel. Did you make sure they liked the video and smash that subscribe button? Yes, I did. And ask them to leave any questions or thoughts in the comments. It helps me a ton. Thank you for watching. And if you'd like to talk to me yourself, go to gridspace.com and click on any one of our demos. Thank you and talk to you soon. Thank you, Grace.